Welcome to A Closer Look with Mark and Mark. I am Miller. He is Shine. And Mark Shine, we are winding it down. A tournament draw is going to be a it week is. from Sunday. Yeah, the ladies draw this weekend. That's a big deal. A lot of games this week for them to prepare for that. And it's a big weekend for the boys between the games Friday, Friday and Saturday and next Tuesday. Everybody wants to position themselves. Everybody wants to look good going into the tournament draw. And it's a good time to play well right now. All right. Well, let's look at some review games. I get to start. Or no, you get to start. Get you got the game yeah, that we I did. Do. What a good one. What a good game we did. You know, we talk about games that are, are one half to one team, the other half to the other team. That was this game right here. Marion Local with a great first half. They uh, have a 30-point first half. Tyler Mesher, 6'2", 240. Couldn't guard him inside. Marion Local came in 3-0 in the MAC and won a four-game win streak. And they're playing Fort Recovery. I thought Nathan Bruns played well for them at 6'6", 205. How about the big guys they have? And then Matt Rethman, really good defensively in the first half on Peyton Judy. Got a lot of help, but did very well defensively, too. In the second half, though, Fort Recovery, the home team, comes alive and ends up with Peyton Judy ends up the game with 10. Derek Judy, Ryan Braun, Noah Lenhart's all have eight points apiece. Grant Kanapke made a big three, and all of a sudden we're down to last possession. Peyton Judy got a chance to make a runner to buzzer. A difficult shot that if it would have gone, would have tied the game. It did not. And Marion Local escapes with a 39-37 win over Fort Recovery. Marion Local also won on Saturday night, 57-49 over St. Mary's. This weekend they have Minster and are at Fort Laramie, a game we'll preview a little bit later on. And Fort Laramie, or Fort Recovery, they also lost on Saturday night. They got Parkway and Mississippi Valley this week. All right, there you see some highlights. OG 80 at Shawnee 61. OG got off to a fast start. They led 25-10 after one quarter. They hit eight of their first 10 shots. Jake Dybul ended up with 22 points and 8 rebounds. Jay Kaufman, 21 points and 14 rebounds. Ethan White tri chipped in with 12. Shawnee, just the opposite. They missed their first 13 shots of the game. Johnny Caprella ended up with 15. Tyler Moore coming back from an injury. They'll be good to have him back. He had 13 points. That puts Shawnee at 11 and 5, 2 and 2 in the WBL. OG rolling, 15 and 0, 5 and 0 in the league. Everybody chasing them. I talked to an official who did that game. The physical presence inside of Ottawa Glendorf, and that's something we're going to have to talk about later on. We talk about matchups that will take place in that league. Let's move to the NWCC, where Temple goes to USV. Coming into this game, Temple was 3 and 1 in conference play, and USV was 3 and 0. And Temple Christian led by three and a half. We're tied at 42 going to the fourth quarter. And it goes like this. Howell makes a three to put Temple up six with three minutes to go. But Quinn Sanders, the freshman, made a conventional three-point play. I don't like the term old-fashioned. That cut the lead to three with 50 seconds to go. He made a couple of, scored again, cut it to one. Howell made a couple of free throws. Lowry and Sanders both made free throws. Late in the game, we're tied at 60. Hipshire makes a three. Howell makes two, three, makes three free throws. The tie to 63, and then Sanders makes one out of two free throws with 13 seconds left. And USC continues undefeated in conference play with a 64-63 win over Temple. Bowman had 25, Howell 18, a season high for Draper. He had 14 with 4-3. Sanders had a season high with 24. Daniels with 17, Lowry with 10, and USV stays undefeated in conference play. Wall pocket St. Henry. Mark and I were there on Saturday night. St. Henry gets the three-point win, 53-50. St. Henry um, had a 15 to 5 fourth quarter as they came back from a deficit and ended up winning that thing for Wapak. Aaron Good had 20 points, including four threes, and Adam Scott, 10 points and seven rebounds, and really dominated inside early on for St. Henry. Who else? Tyler Schlarman, 27 points. He had three threes and seven rebounds, and he really just took this game over in the fourth quarter down the stretch. He was the difference. Wapak, 11 and 5, St. Henry. 14 and 2. Our breakdown plays this week, Mark, come from this game. We've got some good things to show you from this game when we get to our individual play breakdown in segment number two. Let's go to Finley at Lima Senior. This game was originally scheduled for January 12th. Finley came in having lost a three in a row before they beat Toledo Central Catholic on Friday night. Lima Senior also had lost on Friday night to St. Francis by nine. So this game uh, ends up being kind of a, of a match that should have been played much earlier. Finley led 25-23 late in the first half, but the Spartans scored the last nine points of the half. 
during that time period. Cologne made two free throws. Miller made a transition basket. Daniel got loose for a transition basket. And then Daniel also made three free throws with 11 seconds to go. And with that, the Spartans take a seven-point lead. They score the first three points of the second half, and Finley spends the rest of the game trying to catch up. Jacob Logston makes a three with 11 and a half seconds to go, but that's as close as they could get as Jaleel King and Daniel each made a free throw late, and the Spartans win 68-63. The Spartans uh, host Toledo, uh, Toledo Clay on Tuesday night. That's the 30th of this month. And then they have St. John's in on Friday night in a big matchup in the track. Finley at Clay and at Shawnee this weekend, a game we'll talk about later on. All right, stat stuffers, I get to start. We're going to say the Fort Jennings team stuffed some stats. Cole Horseman had 13 points, and then Weary, Trentman, Ricker, and Klausing each had 11 points. How's that for team scoring? And they come away with a big win. How about the coach who says, let's take out their leading scorer? <laughs> which Say, one? Coach, which one? <laughs> They're 13, 11, 11, 11, 11. All right, how about let's move over to the BVC. Tanner Schrader from Macomb. Macomb's not had the best of years that they'd like to have, but Schrader had 19 with three three-point field goals and a 56-48 win over Liberty Benton. And on a, they had 15 with four threes on Saturday night in a eight-point loss to Patrick Henry. For sales Tigers, they always got some guys stuffing some stats. This time, Justin Arns and Keaton McEldowney each had 24 points. They beat Rushi 71 to 51 last Saturday night. Okay, let's move over to Perry. Mark and I get to see Perry this weekend on Friday night. Logan Dre lit it up uh, on Friday night. He had 26 and six made three-point field goals. It's an 87-30 win over Harden Northern on Friday night. We get to see them this week against Ridgemont. Jaron Sharp from Kenton had 22 points, including two threes, and a loss to Van Wert, 55-53 in overtime. What a good game that was. He had 25 points, including two more threes, in a win over Ada, 42-21. And Mark, it's that time of year we're starting yeah. to get some milestones. Yes, we, we got a couple of good ones. You we got do. This week, it's, uh, we'll start with the ladies this week from Lipsick, and that's Kiara Meyer scored her 1,000th point in a 52-42 win over Elida. She had 19 in that particular game and put her over 1,000 for her career. Congratulations. Another guy going over 1,000 points is Brandon Weary from Fort Jennings in a 62-52 win over New Knoxville. He had 11 points and went over the 1,000-point mark. And Brody Bowman, who is a junior, and how about that? <laughs> He's a junior going over 1,000 points, but he scored his 1,000th point in a 62-52 win, excuse me, of 75-64 win over Bradford. Then he came back on Saturday night with 37 and eight threes. 37 is a season high, and the third time this year Bowman has been over 30 points this year. Yeah, he's going to put some big numbers he's up. He's going to put time some really done. big numbers up. Yes, he is. All right, rule of the week. Put your officials' uniform on. Let's talk about fans and officials. Yeah, let's look at it from the official standpoint and fan behavior. And obviously, the OHSAA has done a lot with their respect the game idea. And by the way, as part of doing some research on this, Mark, the uh, N National Federation of High School Athletics, uh, www.nfhslearn.com, has a video entitled The Role of Parents in Sports. And it's something that coaches, parents, fans, and players, too, should all take a look at. There's some really good stuff in it. Um, you want to take a look at that. Again, it's nfhslearn.com. But how about just the role of how the officials play and what their responsibility are when it comes to fans? Well, Rule 2, Section 8, Article 1 says... The home team is responsible for spectator behavior. Not really a, a official's role in that particular thing. However, it does allow an official to assess a technical foul if spectator, or spectators plural, interfere with the proper conduct of the game. Remember a couple weeks ago, back before Christmas, we showed the uh, silent night over there at mm -hmm. Taylor University, yep. and they scored 10 points. All the fans rush on the floor. Could have gave them a tee because they interfered with the conduct of the sport. Remember a few years ago, we were throwing dust up in the air at Elida Fieldhouse mm -hmm. and it got in the, mm -hmm. on the floor because mm -hmm. it got up in the air system. Uh, mm -hmm. Years back, it was common. Okay, when we score our first basket, we're going to throw toilet paper on the floor. Those are types of things that could allow a spectator or spectators to be assessed a technical foul. But officials have been warned, they don't do that if you don't really have to because it interferes with the team and not really their fault that their spectators were out of line. So that really is something that they try to stay away from. Um, to stop the game, go to home management, ask them to take care of it. And because this question came up earlier, suppose you can't find the AD, suppose you can't find the principal or whoever's supposed to be in charge at that particular moment, the head coach of the home team is in charge of home game management. How about that? Also, Rule 1, Section 18 says no uh, music or sound effects when the ball is in play, only during pregame, timeouts, halftime, and postgame. 
no artificial noisemakers. And by the way, the OHSAA tournament rules also say uh, no signs or banners. Those are for tournament mm -hmm. games only. And in tournament games, you must wear a shirt. <laughs> that's, that, that's a good rule. You know, none of that putting a big S and K and I and whatever <laughs> oh, and on your shirt, okay. you know, on your, your chest. Yeah. Got to wear a shirt to an OHSW. Football, you're game. allowed to do it because yeah. they like to see idiots do it when it's and, zero. And it's 12 below zero. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> All right, good job on the rule right. of the week. We I got a couple of good bright spots. We're going to start off with our good buddy Dave Froelich from uh, Van Wert, who used to do games with yeah. us, and you coached uh, against Dave. Yeah. There you guys are doing a game. Go ahead and talk about Dave's honor. Uh, we did that game earlier. This, uh, this game was at Wapak this year. So Dave does a game with us occasionally when he can. But the honor is he's going to be inducted into the Basketball Coaches Hall of Fame. The ceremony will be this Friday night at Van Wert. The actual induction will take place on April 21st. Dave is a Van Wert High School graduate, played at Alma College. He's been coaching for 34 years with 420 wins. 21 of those were at Van Wert with 279 wins, 188 losses won eight sectional championships, won the district five times, and one of those guys who is really just a great guy to yeah. be around and yeah. knows high school basketball and college basketball, <laughs> and it's a lot of fun to be around. Very knowledgeable. Congratulations, Dave, and we'll try to get some of the highlights next week, too. Very deserving. Very yes, deserving. Our other bright spot is when we were at Fort uh, Recovery on Friday, Mark and I got with Brent Kneekamp, the football coach at Fort Recovery. We've always been interested in, in his career and the, the career of Fort Recovery football, right. not that old, and how they struggled and hung in there, and now they're reaping the benefits of that. And so we want you to take a look at this interview with Brent Kneekamp, Fort Recovery's head football coach. We're at Fort Recovery High School with a football coach here, Brent Neekamp, in this wonderful athletic facility you have. And, Coach, we've been intrigued by the fact what's happened with your program. Football started in 1995 here. You were a part of some of those early classes. Um, Ten years, three head coaches, 24 wins, and the job came open. Why did you get involved with Fort Recovery football at that point? Um, I, it was – I guess I felt a sense of uh, service, really, towards my community. And it was a chance for me to come come home. Um, I'm from Fort Recovery. My wife's from Fort Recovery. This is where we wanted to raise a family. And I thought, you know, if I if I can get uh, in the school system this way, that'd be great. And if I can contribute, you know, to my town by by, tr you know, putting together a, a good football program, um, giving the, our players a, a chance to feel like they're working towards something worthwhile and developing, you know, I, I thought I, I could try to do that. You know, Brent, when, when you take a job, you always think you can turn it around. You always think you can win there. That's the goal. And that didn't happen right away. You had to try to build this thing. You had a five and five early on, and that took patience on your part and on the community's part. Why were both sides so patient to wait for what you are reaping the benefits of now? And that's great success. Well, I... I <laughs> I tell people a lot that um, when I took the job, I don't think there was people beating down the door, you know. <laughs> and uh, so it, it may, maybe wasn't necessarily that I was this great candidate or anything like that, but I was willing to do it. And like you said, the community was willing to be patient. I was allowed to make mistakes and work through things and develop. Uh, I got to give a lot of credit to our administration and our school board over those years. Um, Barb Saltbein was our athletic director. And then uh, now we got Kurt Ramble. They've been great to work with. And, and all the principals I've worked with from Ed Snyder, Dave Warville, Jeff Hobbs, and Marcus Overman, they've all been very, very supportive. And I, I think that's really important. Okay, so Coach, four years ago, you finally have your first winning season and you make the playoffs and everything's kind of vindicated. Had to make, had to make you feel pretty good at that point. It, it did. It really did. Um, it, it made me feel good for all the guys who – who played um, in those earlier seasons, um, kind of like a kind of like an assurance that they they were building something special. You know, that's what we 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 talked about all the time, and it, and it kind kind of came to fruition. And so I, I just when you know when we had those seasons and had those games, uh, winning a state championship, looking into the stands and seeing all those guys that played for us over the years. And you could just feel that, that they were part of that, too. And that was important. Was there a time, um, maybe it was a season, maybe it was an off season, maybe it was uh, seeing some younger players at the lower grades that you thought, we're going to get this thing done, we're going to get this thing turned, and we're going to be pretty good in a while. Did you sense that? You know what? I, 
Not necessarily. I, I, you know, for me, it was more like a day to day, just go try to do the best you can get better every day and see what happens. You know, that's what we always told our kids too. Um, looking back, I should have realized it and I wasn't smart enough to or whatever, (laughs) but, um, what I didn't realize is we went through a stretch there where we were winning all of our non-conference games Mm -hmm. and we weren't winning a lot of games in the league, but we were beating teams in our non-conference games that were making it into the postseason. Mm -hmm. And then we would finish three and seven or four on four and six. And it wouldn't look that, you know, spectacular, but once we were able to get over the hump and get into the postseason, then we, you know, then I kind of realized, oh, we were a lot closer than I even realized. And I was telling the kids, we're closer than you think. Keep at it, you know. We were closer than I thought we were, too. So you you, seeing Will Holman in eighth grade would have kept me around. Yeah, (laughs) that that, that didn't hurt. (laughs) So you go 13 and 2. The other night, I'm I'm flipping through the TV channels, and Rocky II's on. And at the end, he's all beat up, and he's in the middle of the screen, screen, and he goes, uh, yo, Adrian, I did it. You're 13 and 2. You win a a state championship. When you're in the bus, you're in the locker room afterwards. Did you go to yourself, I did it? (laughs) Um, We did it. You know, it it really was that. I, there's a, you know, Dave Blockberger was a longtime assistant. He, he's um, still volunteering with us, and, and he was with me for, for all those years. And um, we built up a staff over those years, and, and the kids really bought in. And just there, there was a lot of pieces to the puzzle um, that, that just kind of fell into place the right way. I think, I think really what happened was we were allowed to have a – a program that could develop and improve. And we were able to, over time, put the right things in place so that when we did have the right group of kids come through, we had the chance to have success. Um, Sometimes I think things change too quickly before they allow the the development and, and allow those things to happen. So maybe when you do get that right group of kids, maybe the right things aren't in place. Maybe you don't have that staff that's all on the same page or whatever else it is. Um, so maybe you missed those opportunities. We were fortunate that we, we were allowed to, to get everything kind of in place and, and things were running well and we got that group of kids and it just kind of took off. Well, you've built it. Now you got back to back to back and everybody's not wanting to play Fort Recovery very much anymore. Playoffs are a possibility every year. You've put three kids into college football in three straight years. That's pretty awesome. Where do we go from here for the Indian football? We try to get better. Every day, <laughs> That's right? That's it, every day. We still come in here every day and try to get better. Um, we'll start off the first day of uh, camp next summer and just say, well, we got to get better than we were at the end of last year. Uh, every one of our kids, um, they, they didn't like going away from that, that field in Walpock as, uh, as losers last year to Marion Local in, in that first round. And, you know, they're, they're hungry to try to figure out a way to take that next step and and be better so that's always the challenge it's the challenge when you're winning three games of the year and when you win more than that or you know make the playoffs it's still the challenge is within us can we get better yeah well I'll tell you what you have done a great job Mark and I have really appreciated what you've stood for and your players and we love coming over here to do games even with the the little uh, patio across the way there (laughs) we went up and got congratulations on doing a great job we really appreciate you spending some time Brent Niekamp good luck the rest of the way with Fort Recovery football thank you very much all right we'll go back to the studio and finish up the show We're at the big screen and Coach Shine has some plays from the Wapak at St. Henry game. Yeah, we do. And the first play we're going to put up here is this really nice set that they run for Scott. He's going to be right out here with the basketball as we get this roll. And he starts the players, the flare screen to Copeland, screen, screen, dribble entry, and watch the drop step move. Nice, quick move and up powerful to the goal. That young man can flat out play in the low post. Here we have a chance to see it again. He gets a double screen here from Miracle. And, uh, and good, and here's a drop step move right there, and he powers up inside. That was a really good basketball game we did the other night. Mm-hmm. Then because I'm a fan of backdoor cuts, watch this backdoor cut right here by Shank right there. Freezes the defender and gets the back cut. Starts by coming off the screen action right here, and here's the back cut right there, and there's a nice move for him inside. And then we're going to look at Tyler Slarman. What a great player he is. Watch him come off a screen and go up inside and score. And when they started going him in the second half, good things happen. 
Here's the cut off the screen, the flex cut. He goes up and scores inside. And then we're going to get this move right here. Backdoor cut again. This one goes down inside to uh, Kneecamp, Zach Kneecamp. He gets scored to get fouled. Here's the same play over again. This tied the game. <laughs> every time he stars, yeah, watch the score on the top mm -hmm. of the screen here. Tie game here. And then this shot right here by Schlarman. We stuck this in because this is not a high school player. Watch number five. Watch this move he makes right here. Posts up and then turn around, fall away, jump shot off of one foot. <laughs> How about that, Mark? That's just a nice player having a great year. He gets the screen inside again. That's a bad shot for anybody yeah, else. That's a bad shot for anybody else and just takes it up and strokes it and scores. What a year he's having. What a year that St. Henry's having as well. All right. Thanks, Coach Shine. We'll be back with a final segment right after this. It is time to preview games that are coming up. We're going to do it a little bit differently this week. We're going to look at the by league and the leaders and what games they have left against the other top leaders. Mark, you start with the WBL. Yeah, we thought we'd look at uh, big games coming up in the month of February for all the leagues. Let's start with the Western Buckeye League. First of all, you can see Ottawa Glendorf. They're on top at 5-0. and uh, Wapak and Kenton right behind, although uh, Wapak has a huge game on Tuesday night at Kenton. That's kind of those trap games. You can see records right there. Big games coming up. Well, if OG and everybody continues to win as predicted, or as it looks like anyway, the 16th OG is at Wapak, and February 23rd, Elida comes to town. So two huge games at the end of the season for OG, and you've got one to preview from that conference got, right now. Got a big game coming up. Elida, 15-1, 4-1. Their only loss was to Wapak, also up in there, at Van Wert. Van Wert stands at 8 and 7, 2 and 3 in the league. Elida beat St. Mary's 46 to 31 last Friday and then on Saturday turned around and beat Toledo Central Catholic 72 to 49. Daniel Unruh had 15 and 21 over the weekend with four threes. Dante Johnson consistent scoring had 18 and 16. Van Wert beat Kenton, a big win for them, 55-53 in overtime and Coldwater 60 to 46. In that game against Kenton they had four players in double figures. Drew Bagley, Nate Place, Jacoby Kelly, they had double figures in both games, so they're getting pretty even scoring. So that's going to be a big game, especially if Elida's trying to keep step with OG. Yeah, I've got to watch out for Van Wert. They've really played well here in the month of January. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to look then on a Saturday night game that Mark and I get to do, and that is Finley at Shawnee. Finley is at Clay on Friday night. They have uh, Shawnee has Kenton at home on Friday night. Finley has won this game the last two years by the exact same score, 62-43. And I'm sure Shawnee is glad that Kyle Nunn has graduated because he lit him up for 43 points and five threes in those two victories. However, his brother's back. That's Ryan Nunn. How about the sharpshooters from Finley? Not Ryan Nunn, 17.4 points per game, 24 made threes on this year. Ryan Raw, 13.9. He's made 52 three-point field goals. Those two guys have made a three-point field goal in 15 of Finley's 16 games. And Jacob Logston, who missed the first five games, averaging 11.3. And he's made 21.3s in the 10 games that he's played. Shawnee has lost three out of the last four going into that Kenton game. Johnny Capella at 16.4, including his 40-point game over Wayne Trace. Sheridan O'Neill at 12.8. And this could well be one of those, uh, you know, precision offense and threes from Finley against the transition and go to the basket game for Shawnee. Interesting game for us on Saturday night. Let's look now at the uh, MAC. And, uh, Mark, we're going to go through some of those games right, right now. Here you see the records up there. Versailles sitting up top at 5-0. and Marion Local, 4-0. and St. Henry, they are 4-1 and after a big win last night over Minster and St. John's and Minster with a couple of losses. Versailles plays at St. Henry and at Marion Local. Two huge games, both on the road. Marion Local has Minster yet, and that's the game we're going to highlight. Minster's 9-5, and 3-2. and two. They play at Marion Local this weekend, 11-3, 4-0. Minster lost to Versailles, 61-41, but Isaac Schmiesing had, averages 14.5 points a game. He has 33 threes on the year, and then they lost last night to St. Henry, 53-38. Marion Local beat Fort Recovery. We showed you that one by a point. And then St. Mary's, 57-49. Tyler Meshers averaging just over 18 points a game. Nathan Bruns is 13 points a game and almost seven rebounds a game. Okay, let's move into the NWC and what's going to happen in those particular games. And, Mark, you've got an interesting game, I think, on Friday night, right? Sure do. Crestview, 12-3, 4-0 in the league at Paulding, 6-8 overall, but really good 4-1 in the league. They're right there in the hunt. 
Crestview beat LCC 67-39 and Salina 63-45. They have four players between 12 and 14 points, and they're really starting to play well right now. But Paulding kind of sneaks up on everybody. They beat Ada soundly 63-40, sitting there at 4-1. If they can get by Crestview, they're right there at the top, and they've already beaten the number one team in the league. Only Lincoln View sitting there at 4-0 behind them. Interesting game for Lincoln View also on Saturday night as they play Crestview. Again, Lincoln View 10-5, 4-0. Uh, they play Dolphin St. John's, I'm sorry, on Saturday night. Six games, uh, winning streak, and then a four-game losing streak for Lincoln View, and then another four-game winning streak. So it's kind of been a streaky year for them. During that four-game losing streak, they gave up 68.5 points a game. They're only giving up 51.6 on the season, so defense is the key. Clayton Overholt at 16.2. Caden Ringwald at 14.4. DSJ, they're 9-5, and 3-2. They've got three wins in overtime. They're a defensive basketball team. They give up just 46.4 points per game. Jared Wurst, Richard Kakuza, Connor Houlihan lead them in scoring. Let's take a look at the BVC real quick. PG sitting alone at the top, 6-0, but hope well. 5-1, Van Buren 5-1, North Baltimore 4-1, but PG's already defeated Hopewell and North Baltimore. You can see there a couple of the key games down below. PG has to go to Van Buren, Hopewell at North Baltimore, and so there's a lot to be said about that, but a good game this weekend. Yeah, it's PG at Van Buren this weekend. Of course, the, the PG comes in, the Rockets, they're 12-1, they're 6-0 in conference play. Their only loss was a three-point loss to USV way back on December 23rd. They uh, are second in the conference, averaging 54.7 points per game. Drew Johnson is second in the conference in, in scoring at 17.0. Cooper McCullough uh, has been double figures five times. Phillips has been three times, Brees six times, so they got some balanced scoring. On the other side, um, the, uh, Hope, the uh, Van Buren team, they only have a loss to Hopewell Loudon, 51-47. They score 53.6 points per game. They give up 49.7. Matthew Ayers is third in the conference at 16.5. Cade Stevenson averages 10 points a game. He averages 6.4 rebounds. Matthew Illitz leads the conference, shooting 64.4% from the field. Interesting game. Can somebody knock off PG and make it a race? Well, and then we go to the PCL. The PCL. There you go. And we got a couple games in the PCL to talk about. And there we see that Pandora Gibbo on top again. But a couple big games, Mark, and you've got the first one. Kaleida 12 and 2, 3 and 1 at Ottoville, 13 and 4, 2 and 4. Kaleida beat Lipsick 42 28. Luke Earhart had 13 points and Trevor Lambert 10. Ottoville lost to Fort Jennings 56 42. They were 4 of 30 on three point shots. Tough to win when you do yeah. that. Nick Mormon's averaging 14 points a game, seven rebounds, and Logan Kemper. 13 points to lead those guys. The other big game is Miller City, 2-2 two two in conference play, and Fort Jennings, 3-1 in conference play. Miller City comes in averaging 62 points a game, giving up 54. We've talked about Mark Kuhlman this year, averaging 16.9. Noah Otto, kind of the sharpshooter, big three-point shooter, averaging 14.7. Mitch Gable, 12.6. Lommers can shoot the three also. On the other side, Fort Jennings, we just talked about how balanced their scoring was earlier. They have scored at 55.3. They give up 47.4, and they have that loss to Kaleida in there, so they got to keep things rolling to end up in the PCL. Then let's kind of throw up some of the other conferences. We'll take a look at them. First of all, in the track, St. John's is on top. They've got some key games coming up. In fact, they play five of their last six games on the road. And then we can jump over and take a look at games in the NWC where USV and Elgin are on top and they match up on the 9th of this month. That's an interesting game we'll preview next week. And then the Shelby County League, Fort Loramie, of course, state ranked right there. They're 7-1, and one, but Anna also 7-1. and one. And in February, we're going to have that game for you, Fort Loramie and Anna Rushi. Six and one, also having a good year. And you can see down at the bottom, they're all going to beat each other up these last <laughs> few weeks, and we'll see who comes out of that. Well, let's put up our broadcast schedule for the next uh, week or so. We've got a lot of good ones coming your way. Continental and Wayne Trace. Uh, Wednesday, then Friday, we hit the Defiance OG, PG and Van Buren. Mark talked about Crestview and Lincoln View, the War of the Views over there. Saturday, Ridgemont and Perry. Mark and I call that one. Kaleida Ottoville. You can see the games coming your way. All the way through the weekend, we got some great ones. Sunday, Jackson Center and Fort Loramie, always a good game. Marion Local, Fort Loramie, Kaleida, Wayne Trace. Great games coming your way. We're glad you joined us. Come again next week. We'll update them and preview them. You've been watching A Closer Look with Mark and Mark.